We're back yet again on the Thick Man Inc. podcast to give you our reactions to the delightful slate of games we had this past week. And the biggest story, the 4-4 four and four Vikings who were on fire just lost Kirk Cousins. Now they have immediately replaced him with Josh Dobbs, who I think is a very quality quarterback who was limited by supporting cast in Arizona. But this is a massive hit for the Minnesota Vikings. That 4-4 four four victory against the Packers, it doesn't feel as sweet. Still feels good, of course. You love beating up on the Packers, but it hurts a little bit. And I've been very critical of Kirk Cousins in the past. I think he puts a hard ceiling on how far this team can go given his skill set and his contract and his play in the playoffs. But he was still a nice guy, good regular season quarterback. I was starting to feel it a little bit in Minnesota. If Dobbs is able to step in and fill his shoes, fine. But they have averted complete catastrophe by uh, actually going out there and getting a backup quarterback of some quality. If they had rolled with Jaron Hall, Sean Mannion, Nick Mullins, ugh, those are three stooges, bums, who should not be starting in the NFL. I watched preseason Minnesota Vikings football, and I was disgusted by what those three had shown me. So, Vikings, season still alive, still got you into making the playoffs, and once you're in the playoffs, got a Giants fan sitting next to me. You know, once you're in, things can get a little bit crazy. Bad teams can still win the Super Bowl. I'm Vikings, glad you're admitting they're at least a bad team. I'm talking about the uh, Giants teams that won the Super Bowl. Yeah, but you're comparing them to the Giants, so I'm just assuming, you know. Eh, it's hard to tell. Got Josh Jobs a quarterback. Might not be a good team. But the season's not over. The Vikings are still making the playoffs. I'm still going to tell you they're going to win every single week. And peas and peas don't big Kirko. Well, R.I.P. Perk Thuggins. Well, the NFL and football gods are not smiling down upon the Vikings this season. Isaiah, you know, he kind of, he was over the top with it earlier in the season when it comes to how good the Vikings are going to be. They're going to rip off this win streak. He's, you know, over-exaggerating a little bit how good they've been. But some of the things he was mentioning, the defense turning things around, getting it rolling, that has come true. The offense was kind of finding its way a little bit, picking up a big win against the 49ers, beating up on the Packers, who are pretty pitiful on both sides of the ball. So the oh, whoa, 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 whoa. The Packers aren't a bad defensive team. Let's not be dismissive of Green Bay. They're not bad on defense. They're not pitiful defensively. They're just not a good team. I mean, they're not a good team because their offense stinks, but they're not pitiful on both sides of the ball. They're not doing good on either side of the ball. Well, when you have to play the Vikings, you don't do good defensively. It's just how it goes. What, however you want to phrase it, it lies somewhere in the middle where the Vikings were starting to turn things around. Then Justin Jefferson goes down with an injury. They pick up a big win against the 49ers. They uh, pick up another win against the Packers, but then they lose the second best player on their team. Well, maybe not the second best player. The most important player on their team, though, and Kirk Cousins. And they're stuck looking at Jaron Hall and another quarterback. And who they have Nick Mullins. Nick Mullins and Sean Sean Mannion, uh, Michigan Panthers legend, Sean Mannion. Yeah, you have to think the Vikings were not planning on having to have a backup quarterback this season. And it feels like the NFL doesn't want the Vikings to be great. With Josh Jobs, I do think they're still going to win games. They feel like a team with how much offensive firepower they have on offense that is going to be able to sneak into the playoffs as a seventh seed. I don't think they're good enough to beat the Lions. Their team's healthy. Jameer Gibbs has finally been inserted into that offense. Averaged six yards a carry last night. Granted, it was against the Raiders, and you know, the Raiders are not the best team in the NFL. But I think now, with Josh Jobs, and as long as that offense can still produce with the Bears sucking, the Packers sucking. There's no reason they can't be a, you know, maybe the seventh seed. Now, when it comes to talking about my team, I have to get down. I have to get serious, and I have to address the moronic other Giants fans that are so upset about this last play of the uh, fourth quarter. The center spots the ball. It's the reason the Giants lost. Giants fans need to wake up. You had negative nine passing yards, and you're expecting to win the game. The Giants' offense was so bad with the was I think he's undrafted, Tommy DeVito playing quarterback after Tyrod Taylor went down that Saquon Barkley had 36 carries. That is a lot of carries for any running back in the NFL to get any semblance of offensive production. It was not a good game. They did not deserve to win. You Zach Wilson still threw for 240. 40 yards on the defense. It's not like the defense was limiting Zach Wilson's yards production. Obviously, they weren't scoring that many points during the game, but it was an all-around bad game. And to those that, you know, I saw some people coming at me in the video I made, coming at me in the video I made, Tyrod Taylor should be the starter over Daniel Jones. And they're probably upset 
that the Giants lost this game because they viewed Daniel Jones coming back next week, an opportunity for the Giants to turn things around. This game would have been all that different with Daniel Jones at quarterback. When he's played elite defenses this year, he had 104 passing yards versus the Cowboys, 137 passing yards versus the 49ers. Tyrod Taylor only got injured, I think, nine minutes left in the second quarter. He barely played during that game. He would have eventually reached that 100-yard mark like Daniel Jones did against other elite defenses. And at this point in the season, we're eight weeks into the year. The Giants are dead last in every offensive category. It would have not mattered if Daniel Jones is back there, a healthy Tyrod Taylor. You're getting the same thing from either quarterback. Overall, the Giants season is a disaster, and that's why they're trading someone who can help a team maybe win right now in the Seahawks, Leonard Williams, instead of holding on to them and trying to win this year. So I got a question for you. Is it good coaching to call three straight screen passes late in the game to both keep the clock running? And like the third straight one, really. I understand the first one, and I understand the second one, because it'd be really stupid if you called the same play twice in a row. But was it a bit of good coaching by Dable to call three straight screen passes? It's better coaching than quarterback sneaks on third down. That is such a low bar. They weren't given the uh, Coach of the Year trophy to the previous administration. You got tricked, man. Dable ain't that good of a coach. His offensive play calling, you can find something better. You say all he's using the low, low line's not good, the quarterback's not good. I'm calling a better game than Dable did in the fourth quarter. I have to have some minor sliver, some modicum of faith that the quarterback who is the third stringer in the NFL, one of the 96 best quarterbacks in the world, excluding college, can complete a pass 10 yards downfield. Dable clearly has no faith on anybody in that team, and it's what's going to keep costing games. Get that man out of there. Get him a special teams coordinator job in Minnesota and move on with your lives. Best Find, team. call Lincoln Riley. Lincoln Riley would love to be in a big market like New York. It's perfect for him. The only Get reason Lincoln you Riley. hate Brian Dable is because you're such a big Josh Allen fan, and his a lot of Josh Allen's success and development is attributed to Brian Dable. Josh Allen and is now currently see... leading the league in passing yards, passing touchdowns, and completion percentage, while Dable has been far removed. He also is leading the Shut league up. in choke jobs right now. In choke jobs, is that an official stat? Does PFF it is. have that one? You are it's wrong. It's a thick and man a ink fool. stat. It's a thick man. The ink analytics stat. department. Let me know. Who's the analytics department? Me. Me. You let yourself know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The Broncos beat the Chiefs, and I just wanted to be known. Nobody beats the Denver Broncos 17 straight times. But you know why the Broncos beat the Chiefs? and why this was the Chiefs' first loss in a long time. Referees have been favoring Kansas City. The Chiefs should have lost against the Jets. They should have lost against the Vikings. And they lost against Denver because Denver had the best referee in football calling that game. Brad Out, phenomenal ref, 10-year veteran from UNC Pembroke. Very few people know about Brad Allen. I do. We respect Brad Allen on this podcast in this house. He was calling it fair. He was not giving the Chiefs any unfair advantage. No mysterious flags were picked up. No phantom holding calls. No phantom pass interferences calls. Allen called a straight game against the Chiefs, and that's why they lost. That's why their offense couldn't do anything. That's why the Broncos rose up and rode with Russ and beat Patrick Mahomes. Brad Allen, a unbiased official, the only unbiased official who has ref the Chiefs game this year was why the Broncos won. If you want to tell yourself that's why the Broncos won, you can go ahead and tell yourself. What that. is the other explanation? Are you going to talk about Taylor Swift this not being game, there? No, this game does not move me in the slightest. The Chiefs are going to be fine. They're 6-2. and two. This doesn't tell me. They're, to me, they're still the best team in the NFL. I don't care about this outcome. This was a game between two division opponents. To the Broncos, this game was their Super Bowl. They know they're not going to be playing any big in any big games this season. And I am getting especially tired of the Russell Wilson is all of the sudden fixed narrative. Okay, sure, he has less interceptions this year. We knew that was going to happen with Sean Payton. But when you look at when his big games has come, he's only had like a hundred some low 100 passing yards this game against the Chiefs, but he has five of his eight games this season, less than 200 passing yards. His games where he threw for over 300 yards came against the Dolphins when he won by 50, or lost by 50, sorry, and they came against the pitiful commanders 
defense and what we've seen from them this season. His 220 yard and three touchdown performance came against the Bears. There is nothing good going on in Denver with the Broncos. They played a nice game. They got it done versus a division opponent when Patrick Mahomes also allegedly was dealing with an illness. So I don't care about the outcome of this game. If you care about it or draw any major outcomes from this game, I don't know what to tell you. It doesn't mean anything. It won't mean anything. The Chiefs are still the best team in the NFL. They're still the best team because the NFL saw Brad Allen come in there and ref a phenomenal game and said, oh, God, we can't let this man ref the Super Bowl. We can't let him ref any Chiefs playoff games. Otherwise, our Golden Boys in Kansas City, our Swifties, are going to be eliminated, and we can't have that. That is what this game has done. If Brad Allen refs a playoff game, which he will, he's been refing a lot of playoff games in the past, and it's a Chiefs game, the Chiefs will lose that game. But it won't happen. That is the one thing I can guarantee from this whole endeavor. Brad Allen has lost the right to referee a Super Bowl or an AFC Championship game. Am I being hyperbolic? Possibly a little bit. Did uh, Travis, you being hyperbolic? Did Patrick Mahomes have a bad case of uh, Swifty-itis because she wasn't there? Also probably. All I'm saying is, Chiefs heavily favored by the officials. But on to some teams which aren't so favored by the officials. The Houston Texans and the Carolina Panthers. Two teams with rookie quarterbacks. A rookie quarterback who has been written off already and a rookie quarterback who was crowned the best in his class seven weeks into the season with a much better supporting cast, with better weapons, with a better coaching staff around him, was crowned as the triumphant carrier of the class. Said, oh, this is the guy. This is finally the Ohio State product which works out. Then little Bryce Young. Oh, who cares he's got bad weapons? Who cares he's got an incompetent coach who can't call plays? That guy's a bust. He's not performing the first six games with Adam Thielen as his number one target, someone who would not be the number four target on his previous team, the Minnesota Vikings. Who cares? Bryce Young, bust. Bryce Young outplayed C.J. Stroud. Not really debatable there. I think if you try and debate that, you're a fool. And the numbers on the year clearly favor Stroud. By all means, I'm not saying CJ's a bad quarterback. What I am saying is those people, like you, who like to throw around that bus label six games into the season, who like to make snap decisions of the position which is the hardest to play in the NFL besides maybe quarterback, you look kind of stupid right now. Bryce Young will be fine. It takes the shorter guys like Drew Brees, like Tua Tungvaloa, a little bit longer to develop as pocket passers. And I am very happy to say Bryce Young is starting to look like he's developing. Maybe it's also Frank Wright finally didn't call the offense for the Panthers. That probably has something to do with this too. But I'm excited for what Bryce Young is going to do moving forward. Stroud will be fine, but respect Bryce Young. If you want to call a game in which he wasn't overly that impressive through two touchdowns, was sacked six times. If you want to call, and he also scored 15 points. If you want to call he that an impressive points, performance. He 15 points, the entire offense. Him, just him alone. 15 the points. offense that he leads, he's the most plays the most important position on the team. If you want to laud that performance as his tur- him turning it around, because C.J. Stroud had a slightly worse game against 200 the team yards, that he- two touchdowns, no interceptions, while getting pummeled behind a bad offense against line. the team that he plays on. Sure, be my guest. You need to pump the brakes now on. Oh, all of a sudden, they Bryce Young's team beat C.J. Stroud's team. You evaluate C.J. Stroud with. Uh, you view it from the hate Ohio State quarterback lens. That's how you view him. You let the fact that they have three wins already, the fact that they have, you know, the early production from Nico Collins and Tank Dell, you attribute a lot of CJ Stroud's success to that and what he's done and uh, so their supposed weapons without acknowledging the fact they were the second worst team in the NFL this season. There's still a lot second of... Second worst team last season. Second Last season. There's still carryover from that roster. It's not like all of a sudden they have a roster that's as good as the Kansas City Chiefs or they have a roster that's comparable to the 49ers or the Eagles. That is not the case. They're still not a good roster. And despite what many people think about the Panthers' defense, they have the sixth best pass defense in the NFL right now compared to the Texans 22nd wrecked pass defense so the the going against the Panthers pass defense is not as easy as what people may think just because they're one in six so when you throw this out there it's not like CJ Stroud's playing on a talent loaded roster and the Panthers defense is a bunch of bums just because they hadn't won a game yet and it's not like the Texans are all of a sudden a superpower that 
Bryce Young is all dicing up up and down the field. So CJ Stroud, in my opinion, what we've seen so far has had a much better season than Bryce Young. Now, what I will say is because I'm being a little overly negative in response to you, but this game was encouraging for Bryce Young. I never labeled him a bust. I still think he can be good, but there is much more upside with Stroud, and Richards is not playing right now, also with him, and maybe even Will Levis, who we'll talk about in a bit, There's more than there is with Bryce the Young. There's more upside in Willis than Bryce Young, if you're going to examine, oh, he's more there's No, no, there's not. He's Stop got being... a bigger arm, and he runs around faster. That is why you were saying C.J. Stroud has more upside. And Nico Collins. Good receiver. Tank Dell. Everyone was very high on Tank Dell. The offensive line is clearly better in Houston. It was clearly better going into the season. And the Panthers fans kind of got on you about how our line's not bad. They lied. They are liars. The Panthers' offensive line stinks. That coaching staff clearly favors C.J. Stroud. He's got a better system. He's got running backs like uh, Stingley, Singletary, a duo. Miles Sanders, complete lack of production. Better receivers. Better running backs, better offensive line, better coaches. He is in a better position to succeed. You can't argue that. You say, oh, well, they were a bad team last year. They were a bad team last year with Davis Mills. I'm better than Davis Mills. You're throwing out all these names who are, you know, wide receiver twos at best on other teams, maybe even wide receiver threes when it comes to Nico Collins and Tank Dell. They are nice players, but because it's C.J. Stroud, you like to just make it seem like they're, they're the best players, and C.J. Stroud has stepped into they're an excellent position. They're better than Adam Thielen. They're better Adam than Thielen in, has been producing this yeah, year and having Bryce a Yeah, because Bryce Young resurgence. is force-feeding it to him. Adam Thielen stinks. Adam Thielen is legitimately a wide receiver four on a bunch of teams. I know Adam Thielen better than you. Don't try and say, oh, Adam Thielen. Blah, blah, blah. Adam Thielen's 48 years old, gets to the game in a mobility scooter, has to sit down in one of those little electron-assisted chairs as he goes up the steps every night. Adam Thielen is not good. Adam Thielen would be the third or fourth best receiver on the Texans. I'm sorry you the get... I'm sorry you are finally right about an Ohio State quarterback in the sense that he's not immediately terrible. Still time, though. <laughs> you will recall, I was calling, I will say this, you like saying, oh, the Ohio State Halens, I was calling CJ mid -J as opposed to bum J, which is a clear indication that he is, I thought he at least would be average. Mid. What does Bryce Young do better than CJ Stroud? Play the sport of football in the quarterback position at a high level. I disagree. From what we've seen, it's a small sample size regardless. From what we've seen so far, if you you brought this topic up, oh, Bryce Young outplayed C.J. Stroud. Yes, right? he outplayed C.J. Stroud. That's non-debatable. He's, more playing, yards, a, more he's playing a worse defense than the one C.J. Stroud is playing And C.J. Stroud's playing with better weapons and a better line and better coaches. It balances out. Also, the Panthers are not the sixth best pass defense in the NFL. They might be statistically, but come on. Who have they played? What elite passing offenses have they hindered? The Minnesota Vikings, who are a coin flip team who may or may not show up, that's the best passing offense they have slowed down. Not a, they're not some elite defense. That's the, notice how when he's talking about the Vikings earlier, it's an elite well, high-flying passing attack. That was the, that was the Kirk Cousins era. This is the Josh Jobs era, the elite high-flying passing attack. <laughs> no, 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 no. The, all these weeks you've been saying they're elite offense. They're going to run through everybody. And now when we're talking about the Panthers and you're making an argument, oh, that's the best offense they played, just the Vikings. Just where the they Vikings. Stru where the, they struggled to throw and move the ball. Well, that was pre-Josh Jobs. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Now that Josh Dobbs is here, <laughs> oh. I will say, Josh Dobbs learned the Cardinals' offense in about a week and looked good week one for them, so he's probably starting. In Minnesota, he might be starting now. He could be the guy. In fact, I know he's the guy. Baker Mayfield type perform <laughs> Baker Mayfield Rams type performance next week. Much better than Baker Mayfield Rams. What are we talking about? That dude was a bum on the Rams. Disrespectful. Anyway, other rookie quarterbacks. The one who actually kind of looks like the best rookie quarterback after a single game in an incredibly small sample size did what Ryan Tannehill couldn't do. Found DeAndre Hopkins over and over again. Four passing touchdowns. Efficient through the air solidifying himself as the Titans slash Oilers starter going forward in those crisp baby blue uniforms. Ugh, Will Levis. Certain someone sitting in this room said Will Levis should be a first round pick. He's clearly got the talent. And that talent was on full display. Even if Tannehill gets healthy, he's never taken another snap. It's just not happening. You ride out with the young guy who's clearly got some potential. But Levis has the reins to this offense. He can play horribly the rest of the year and I think the Titans will still keep going with him. They stand a better chance to win with Will Levis on the field. And in addition to them being a revitalized offense better team, 
This also puts the nail in the coffin of Malik Willis. Quarterback who was also supposed to be a long-term project. Levis Cobb's supposed to be a project too, but has looked horrible whenever he played. It's just not the answer. Maybe on a different team, but Malik Willis is probably done with the Titans as well. It's not just necessarily how good Will Levis might be or how lo good he looked in that game, but what that performance truly revealed is just how washed up Ryan Tannehill is and just how bad Malik Willis was in the time we've seen him play with the Titans. Because the Titans offense has looked so bad with Ryan Tannehill the, at the helm. He has two interceptions, no, sorry, six interceptions, two touchdowns over the games he started this year. Malik Willis looked completely lost behind the Titans offensive line when he stepped in and the offense looked inoperable. It had me saying last week that the Titans should be training every offensive piece they have in order to build something towards the future. And after that game, I feel the exact opposite because there, there is a hope within that offense that they can be productive passing the ball. And when you combine that with what Derrick Henry can do, it gives you uh, Titans offense that we haven't even seen when they were good. It, it, it has the ability to push the ball down the field. I mean, the absolute missile Will Levis threw, rolling to his right, cross body, hits Westbrook in stride. Incredible. Now, I will say, you know, a lot of that is being a little bit hyperbolic, but it just shows how much more talented he is than the other two quarterbacks they've had play quarterback played the position for them over the last two years, and it gives their offense way more of a ceiling than it has been with Ryan Tannehill at the helm and Derrick Henry running the ball 30 times a game. So I think it was a great performance. We may, I don't might have baby Josh Allen on our hands. Shut up. But Shut up. The we athleticism. We did not display the ability to run the ball like that. Come on. What are we doing here? Is that just a new I, term for every quarterback with a big arm who's white who comes out of college? Moves well. Thick, moves trunky. Well, thick, trunky, coastal. Is I don't Sam, know if he is coastal. Is Sam Darnold a uh, red hair Josh Allen? Is that where This is what on? we wanted Sam Darnold to be. This is Will Levis. We want Sam Darnold to be a Tennessee Titan? No. We wanted him to have games like routinely like Will Levis just had. Well, that's too bad. He was too trunky and coastal for that now he's west coastal we will see how that works out anyway i believe in will levis i think i believe in him for the rest of the season the titans i think there's five teams right now that are between three and four and four and three so they're right in the wild card race after winning this game and in the afc south which is very rough with the texans still not being that great the colts you know they're kind of doing their thing but with will levis there derrick henry deandre hopkins now looking productive with will levis throwing in the ball they have a chance at sneaking in at the seventh seed i feel like well that or they could win the division the jaguars are a pitiful five win team right now they just do not look good in any of their games i think they're a six win team six win team what Whatever. I don't know. Five Whichever and two, six and two. They could fall apart pretty easily. They have not looked good. So I can see the Titans still winning the division. It ain't over. The music's still playing. Well, the 49ers losing to the Bengals. If you watched my prediction video this past Saturday, I said the 49ers were going to lose. It feels like they're stumbling a little bit. The offense is going through a rut. The defense is also as good and as talented as it is with all the pieces that they have. They haven't looked all that great. And the Bengals, since I made the video saying they were going to collapse... A uh, very similar tune to last season when I said they were going to collapse and then they turned things completely around. They're getting things going. Joe Burrow looks healthier than ever. He's moving around the pocket. He's throwing the ball. They're getting the ball to Jamar Chase. Joe Mixon is looking good again. This was the perfect game for the Bengals to turn things around while the 49ers are, are not looking so great. And a lot... I really still hate the 49ers fan base because they've lost three games. They're still a very solid team in the NFL. And they're all worked up about Brock Purdy not potentially not being the guy. And they're discussing the quarterback situation. And people that aren't 49ers fans are discussing Brock Purdy. You're going to be okay. You're still going to be in the playoffs. It's a tough loss to a good team who's, you know, turning things around right now. And they're on the upslope while you're struggling a little bit. So the rest of the season's going to be fine. I called it. I saw it coming. I don't know what Isaiah's predictions were, but I'll let, uh, since I also have well, no. Well, after Brock Purdy was destroyed by the Minnesota Vikings defense, he entered concussion protocol. Turns out he did not have a concussion. He was just so mentally rattled. He kept hearing Daniil Hunter breathing right down his neck. I thought, oh, God. It followed him around. He was in the shower. He saw a big shout. Oh, God, he's Daniil Hunter. He's still here. He was traumatized 
by that Vikings defense, by those Brian Flores blitzes. Harrison Smith is a ghost which is floating around Brock Purdy's one-bedroom apartment. It ain't easy for him right now. If he gets the psychological help he needs and is able to recover, he'll be just fine. But games like that against the Minnesota Vikings, against Brian Flores, against elite defenses, they can really rattle a young quarterback. I would not be shocked if Purdy kept seeing ghosts like a certain other quarterback on the 49ers roster for many days to come. I think they might be in a little bit of trouble. If Purdy keeps playing like this, though, it is undeniable we will be seeing a little bit of Sam Darnold. He earned himself a very long leash, but when you've got an elite team around you, elite weapons, elite offensive line, that leash does not go on forever. So I'm saying three more weeks. If Purdy has not turned it around by then, the red-haired, trunky coastal kid will be coming to play in San Francisco. Obviously good for the Bengals, whatever. He beat up on a shell-shocked Brock Purdy, as they call it in World War I days. <laughs> whoop de doo You're still not beating the Chiefs. You're still probably not beating the Bills. Well, so, they're probably beating the Bills. They're not beating the Ravens. Probably not beating the Bills. But let's see if the Ravens beat themselves. Their medical team beats the Ravens by the time they play them. Anyway, you got anything else? I don't have anything. Well, you didn't really let me talk about the Leonard Williams trade, but you know. uh, the Leonard. Would you like to talk about Leonard Williams? It was a good trade for both teams. In short. It is a good trade for both teams. The cop out of the century. That is the chant of a man who has just had his favorite team scammed. The I'm Giants got scammed. I'm joking, of course. The Seahawks <laughs> gave up way too much for them. A sec. I mean, the Giants are paying a majority of the contract, but they got a second round and a fifth round pick for a 30 year old defensive tackle that has four sacks over the last, well, not two seasons in total, whatever he's played in this season and last season combined. I, so the, the sack numbers of defensive tackles honestly do not move me all that much. You said, oh, Dexter Lawrence, elite defensive player, couldn't crack seven sacks, I think, last season. Doesn't mean he wasn't good, just means that position doesn't generate sacks unless you're Chris Jones or Aaron Donald and you kind of get bumped out to that end position. Interior D lineman should not be measured. See, well, he's not a nose tackle. Sacks. Even three techniques. If you're not working against tackles on the edge, your sack numbers are not going to be that high. If you're getting the double team rates, like I assume Leonard Williams was, although with Dexter uh, sitting down there on that D-line next to him, I can't imagine Leonard Williams getting too many doubles. But it'll be fine. Seahawks D-line still stinks. Their line still stinks. They'll probably make the playoffs, but... <laughs> unmoved all around. I like the Seahawks fully committing to the Geno Smith era and giving up valuable draft capital to win now while the 40, you know, it's a move in my opinion to really compete and beat the 49ers. It gives you a defensive lineman that adds veteran depth to that defense. It gives you a better chance at slowing down and stopping Christian McCaffrey and competing with a veteran and very good 49ers offensive line. So I like the moves for the Seahawks in that respect that they're trying to win and compete now, possibly win the NFC West while they're sitting at the top of the NFC West. So that's why I also like it for the, the Seahawks. The Seahawks are winning the NFC West. All right, cut it at that. They currently are. They ain't going to continue currently winning it. You're a hater. I'm right.